So before I get into this, I just wanted to thank everyone again for being here, and especially um, to my advisor and my committee for making this happen. It's been kind of a tight schedule, and I really appreciate you know everything you guys have done. So as a way of introducing the topic, I kind of wanted to show you some of the overarching, or talk about some of the overarching questions that guided this study throughout it. So the what was kind of touched on in the uh, title, obviously, looking at a patch reef, but a patch reef with, with particularly well-developed large stromatolites, great lamination, um, some of the location, uh, some of the southernmost locality ones are really spectacular, up to a meter thick. Um, these are some of the examples. As I mentioned, uh, really well-defined laminae in some of these, as you can see in these columnar stromatolites. Uh, here's one of the thicker units. This is a view looking from the north, and this is a view looking straight on at it towards the west. So as you can see, this one is about a meter thick. Um, this is a block that had tumbled out, and the uh, top view of this is what you're seeing right here. Um, you can see a couple of these individual domes going on. And this is about uh, half a meter to three quarters of a meter across. So as you can see, they're fairly large aggregates. Um, so real briefly, how do stromatolites develop? Uh, they're going to be developing, growing in a protected environment, something that isn't going to be subject to a lot of wave action that will wash away the bacterial mats before they could lithify. Um, so you're looking at either a lagoonal or a subtidal environment. Secondly, you need to have an absence of burrowing and grazing that would obliterate the mats as they grow or wouldn't allow them to lithify and to have the formation of the laminae. Um, finally, you also have to have ocean water chemistry that's favorable to carbonate precipitation. Um, that's a generic one, so to kind of put more of a point on it, what specific factors allowed for development of this particular patch reef with this in interval and not in the others? So one of the things to think about is that this is a Triassic aged um, formation, the virgin limestone, is Smithian Spathian in age. And um, here is the Triassic. So this is a graph of um, the abundance of stromatolites throughout time. Uh, in the Precambrian and Cambrian, uh, stromatolites are really well represented in the rock record. However, by the late Ordovician, they've declined almost entirely in both abundance and in diversity of the stromatolite forms. Um, you can see a resurgence, however, starting in the late Permian and going peaking in the early Triassic and then tapering off again by the late Triassic, and that corresponds to the recovery interval after the end Permian mass extinction, where the estimate is um, you know, up to, I think, 96% of marine genera disappeared. Um, so taking a look at some of those factors and applying that directly to the Blue Diamond site, looking at the um, bioturbation that was observed in the mudstones overlying the stromatolite bearing unit. These are examples, again, from Blue Diamond itself. Here's one of the cut billets where I was lucky enough to capture a cross-section of a worm burrow. Um, as you can see from this example, and here are one, two, and there's a third one up here. As you can see from these examples, they're fairly simple burrows. They're linear, uh, generally unlined, and they're also horizontal to the bedding plane. Um, this is a case of spaghetti rock. Again, you're see seeing more linear, like here's a simple burrow, here's another linear burrow. So although there's an abundance of these burrows, they don't penetrate more than about two or three centimeters into the sediment here. So looking down on it, it looks like there's a lot going on, but you're not seeing it penetrate into the deeper layers and really disrupt the sediments. Um, that's indicative of a more stressed or anoxic environment. And um, this is kind of comparing it to the ignofabric index, which is a way of quantifying how much disruption you're seeing. So based on what I'm seeing in the overlying units above the stromatolites and in the stromatolites themselves, um, usually it's somewhere between a one and a two, where there's a little bit of disruption, but the laminae are still largely preserved. Um, in really intense cases, it might be somewhere between like a three and a four, where there's a little bit of evidence of um, what used to be zones, and so you get a modeled fabric where you don't see the full laminations anymore. Um, the other factor is ocean water chemistry. When you have simple things like, uh, well, I shouldn't say simple, in the case of seafloor precipitates or fans, um, the 
precipitation of the inorganic carbonate cement is basically driven by diffusion gradients and concentration. That's what this is, equation is. So this is an example of the acicular cements um, presented by Grotzinger and Knoll. This is an example from uh, Dr. Woods' study in 2007 looking at the uh, inorganic precipitates on the seafloor cements. Um, over in the Union Wash Formation, which is the deeper water analog of the um, virgin limestone. So it's a contemporary aged unit, it's just deeper on the shelf. Um, so looking specifically at also what effect the stromatolite layers or the microbial community might have on um, the ability of the mats to lithify. You also have to take into account not just the abiotic precipitation of carbonate, you also have to look at the respiration and what that might do to the local environment. So in the case of um, photosynthesis, you're driving, uh, you're capturing carbon dioxide which falls into the sediment as organic material and as it gets buried along with any um, growth of the actual microbial community that then gets buried, you're dealing with a um, anoxic decomposition of the organic material which drives the amount of carbon dioxide and bicarbonate up as well as hydrogen sulfide. So with the sulfur sulfate reducing heterotropes breaking that organic material, you have enhanced burial of carbon as well as the presence of hydrogen sulfide. So these are some things to keep in mind when I take a look at the um, geochemistry and also what um, these stromatolite layers look like. There's an abundance of iron staining and pyrite going on. And that's what these examples are showing. So these are examples again from the specific blue diamond site in proximity to the stromatolite bearing layers that kind of give evidence of something going on with ocean water chemistry, some sort of perturbation. So this is a unit below the stromatolite bearing unit where there's, um, these are millimeter, uh, millimeter scale pyrite crystals that are encrusting a layer. Um, you can also see pyrite staining in the stromatolite matrix itself that kind of calls out the lamination. And additionally, um, there are inorganic precipitates going on. So this is an example of a flat pebble conglomerate that's fairly common throughout the lower section of the virgin limestone. Um, these are formed when there is rapid and intense cementation of the seafloor. And before it gets fully lithified, a storm event might rip it up and redeposit it as a conglomerate. So this is um, an example of inorganic precipitation of carbonate, and additionally, ooids are also common in the um, stratigraphic section. So these are all indicators that you have favorable conditions for carbonate precipitation that would also help enhance growth of the stratolites. So this is kind of um, the real kicker question. Why is it worth studying another example of anachronistic facies? Based on the background information, there's a whole bunch of studies going on. Um, these are examples from the southwestern United States, but there are a bunch of studies. For example, um, Bout et al. records stromatolites in Turkey, um, Armenia, Iran, and Press et al. 2006 also described stromatolites uh, of the early Triassic in Turkey. So you're seeing worldwide impacts of these stromatolites resurging. Um, to kind of narrow it down, just in the southwestern United States, these are examples of strom uh, early Triassic stratolite stromatolites that are recorded by Schubert and Botcher, by Pris and Botcher, and also by Marion Woods. So why do we need another example of stromatolites? Well, the initial, um, these studies kind of point to an idea that there is worldwide anoxia that allows for the resurgence of anachronistic facies and this period of delayed recovery. However, more recent studies from Marenko et al. and Brayard et al. show that there are stromatolites intergrown with sponges, or in the case of the Brayard study, there are um, stromatolite reefs that include bivalves, gastropods, brachiopods, serpulates, and sponges. So you're seeing a more complex cohort of reef building animals, and this is within 1.5 million years of the end Permian mass extinction. So this is a far more rapid tempo of recovery that refutes the earlier idea that there was a lag period universally, or I shouldn't say universally, but shelf wide. So the fact that you have these um, discrepancies between timing means that there are local factors that go into play. And that's what the significance is of studying the um, Blue Diamond site, because there are um, 
obviously local factors, so that would be things like water depth, the makeup of the individual community, um, individual, uh, excuse me, I'm catching my breath here, <sighs> periods of flooding from, um, of anoxic water from the deeper shelf environment up onto the shallower shelf. And these are all factors that interplay to create the recovery interval locally. So by looking at the stromatolites as a case study at the Blue Diamond site, we're giving a little bit more detail into this increasingly complex model. So that's really what's driving the hypothesis, that there are um, local and intermittent stresses that allow for the emergence locally of these patch reefs but it might not necessarily be a shelf-wide event. So moving on to the study location, why choose Nevada for this particular study? Um, the, um, oh, excuse me. This is a study from Marzolf trying to basically take a look at Mesozoic rock units. And due to basin and range and these thrust sheets, um, a lot of the Mesozoic sediments or Mesozoic rock units got dismembered and dispersed across the southwest. At the latitude of Las Vegas, these are some of the least deformed, least chopped up units. So the fact that I was able to look at an outcrop that's really well defined from the contact between the lower red and the lowermost um, virgin limestone and then go up the stratigraphic column from there um, is really valuable because it's fairly intact and we can really place where this unit is. So that's one of the values for choosing um, this less deformed, um, better exposed area. This is an example, uh, well, this is the aerial that kind of shows that less deformed unit. So the area I'm talking about is this block right here of virgin limestone. You can see there's a little bit of pink there that represents the red beds of the lower red. So this is the very bottom of the virgin limestone, which is great because that's where I start my stratigraphy. Um, this is a north-south approximately trending ridge, and it's a little more than three kilometers long. I traced a transect from this lowermost or this southernmost locality, locality A, all the way up three kilometers to locality C up here. A, B, and C refer to the areas where I collected stromatolites for characterizing the fabrics and creating um, petrographic thin sections. Um, let me go ahead and show you the transect real quick, so that kind of puts it into context. Um, this is the transect A, A that follows the escarpment on the east side of the ridge. In addition to that, to get a little bit more detail at A where the best exposures were, I also followed one of these drainages where the stromatolites were um, exposed in a stream cut. However, because a lot of it's covered with alluvium, there wasn't a whole lot and it's a very short transect before you just run out of, uh, before you run out of that particular unit. Um, so there were also a few samples that were collected from BB for characterization of the stromatolites. To give you context about what the environment was in this area, during the early Triassic, um, I've got one of Blakey's really nice colored photos that shows here at Southern Nevada, you would have had um, basically a warm water shelf in tropical latitudes, the open shelf environment, um, warm climate enhancing evaporation would have really facilitated the precipitation of the carbonate that um, gives the virgin limestone its distinctive carbonates. Um, these environments are represented here in this little inset uh, adapted from press and woods that shows that the blue diamond area was an inner shelf to outer shelf environment. And obviously as the sea level transgressed, you're going to see the deeper water and these environments shift towards the east. And as it regresses, you're going to see it shift to the west. And it's also notable that at Blue Diamond there's a gypsum well. So that kind of speaks to the evaporites that you would have seen. Um, so during this period, we're looking at between inner and outer shelf environments. This is going to be a little bit deeper water. Um, and it's dominated by carbonates. So that would be um, this portion of the Moenkopi right here. So you've got limestone with shale interbeds. But as I mentioned, this is the contact with the lower beds. So you're actually seeing a transgression from tidal flat red mudstones into the more um, limestone dominated virgin limestone unit. So to go real quickly through the findings, I divide it into three basic sections. Um, during the field investigation, I was looking at the cont uh, continuity of the bioherm, 
uh, looking at morphological variations in the stromatolites over that transect area, and also looking at whether fossils and bioturbation was observed over that transect area. The data that I collected during the field investigation was used to generate three stratigraphic columns, mm -hmm. and the A, A, uh, I'm sorry, the A locality um, was also included geochemistry data to go alongside that stratigraphy. And finally, looking at the um, microscopic features that went with the macroscopic forms. So if there were any kind of fabrics that were associated with the gross morphologies that were observed in the field. And that's um, polished slabs and thin sections. So a lot of the rest of this talk is going to be very visual. It's going to be photographs. So real quickly with the continuity, although the stromatolites were not contiguous over the entire section, um, throughout A, A prime, sometimes there would be uh, portions of the unit were, that were just featureless mudstone. No stromatolites were observed. However, you could always pick them up again. So it was really um, a patch reef. Uh, the most common were isolated hemispherical domes as represented by this stippled pattern, and they were observed across the entire transect. Um, I wanted to really call out what made each of these localities individual and what was really characteristic about them because these are the areas where I did collect samples specifically for characterization. Um, as I mentioned before, AA, I'm sorry, locality A along transect AA was really distinctive for the large domal stromatolites. They had very high relief. You can see here how they would have jutted out above the seafloor um, and they have very well-defined laminae. These uh, really well-developed thick aggregates are only seen at the A locality, represented by this little blue patch. Um, in the stream cut here, off to the side, this kind of this uh, BB prime transect, the exposures were a lot poorer, and there are mostly rafts that were weathered out of the um, bedding planes, so you could observe in three dimensions. These are extremely uh, thin in comparison. They're usually between five and 10 centimeters thick total. Um, the domes are either simple interlinked domes, like these guys here, or there might be intergrown sort of meandering ridge shapes, like these here. Um, the other thing that's notable is that at these locations, there is this white to light gray infill in between the domes. And frequently in that infill, there are also some simple planolites trace fossils. And that's represented by the pink. They were observed at the B to B prime transect and also at the northernmost locality, which is up here, locality C. Um, for the B site, starting about midway between A and B and moving northward, this form became common. I started calling these um, lozenge shapes because you have these aggregates that have this flattened kind of long, uh, larger flat shape. They have a dimpled top surface and they have these really pronounced overhanging sides. The other thing that makes these distinctive is that this top, I was kind of calling them muffin tops, also existed on top of a um, laminated span. So this area here is not well represented in this photo, but I will show you another photo where I show you the sides. Um, this is also a laminated section, so these are columnar and domal uh, stromatolites down below. So these are thick aggregates, but they're more on the scale of like a third to a half a meter thick. And these are represented by the stripe pattern here, and they're located mostly at locality B. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, up at locality C, where exposures weren't quite as good, um, you see the meandering ridges and intergrown domes once again. These are very um, thin intervals, so you're looking at a maximum of maybe 10 centimeters thick for the entire stromatolytic unit. And laminae are very rare. This is one example where there's a little bit preserved here, you can see, but it's interrupted, it's waving, and it's completely discontinuous. So just to look a little bit more at these individual morphologies, there are, as I mentioned, four different shapes. So with the individual hemispheroids, they're generally increasing in width, so you have more of a cabbage shape, and they have really um, very pronounced domal shapes to them. They're generally small, five to 10 centimeters in height. Laminae are very well exposed, especially when they're weathered. You can see the individual layers pop out. They're found non-continuously along the transect. These are the most common form that were observed at Blue Diamond. And there are very few individual burrows to no bioturbation observed. Um, 
moving on with the aggregates of large domes and columns. These are the thick units seen at the southernmost locality, locality A, and they're up to a meter thick. They have very well-defined laminae. This is one of my favorite examples here. And you can see, again, as with the individual domes, you have really high relief and you're seeing a lot more um, height above what would have been the seafloor. So you can imagine these really standing up above the substrate. Um, this is another example. This one is almost spherical here, showing again that high relief and the increasing width from the base. So um, as I mentioned, uh, let's see, there are few burrows and almost no bioturbation in the upper sediment. Uh, finally, with, I shouldn't say finally, this is the second to the last. These are the intergrown domes and meandering ridges. These are generally small, only four to eight centimeters in relief, in height, uh, low relief. It's, a, it's not a very thick accumulated unit. Um, bioturbation is commonly observed in the overlying sediment and also in this gray infill. Uh, laminate is generally discontinuous if it's observed at all. It's very, very uncommon. I think I only found one example with preserved laminate. Um, this is the example that I mentioned. It's kind of discontinuous. Even trying to put a trace on it, it's a little bit hard to follow. So these intergrown domes um, are the examples that were seen in the BB transect and at the northernmost of the A transect at locality C. And this is um, an example of the bioturbation observed in proximity to the dome. So here's a dome, and then here's some of that shallow um, bioturbated spaghetti rock. Uh, here's another example between ridges. Um, right here is a linear feeding trace. So you do have some shallow bioturbation going on associated with these less developed samples. Um, this is the final type. This is the lozenge shape that has the flattened muffin top kind of upper mass overlying a laminated portion. So this is an example of the underlying laminated mass and this is another example here where you can see weathering is allowed splitting along the planes of that laminated unit. So this is the overhanging top portion, which is um, that flattened surface, and then a separate underlying unit here of just the columnar intergrown um, section. So moving on, um, this is another example of how these um, large masses weathered out of the rock and you can see the uh, laminated interval often it was flipped over and it just separated along those planes. So this is another example of those lozenge type topped masses. Uh, moving on to the stratigraphy and geochemistry. I'm basically placing all three stratigraphic columns next to each other to kind of make a point. The locality A exposure is so much better. You can find a lot more of the siltstones preserved. Additionally, in the covered intervals represented by these gray boxes here, um, you were able, or I was able to uncover shale by digging a couple inches below the ground surface, so between six inches to a foot or so, I was able to find um, intact bedding in these shale units. Versus up at the B locality, um, there are far fewer covered intervals where shale was recovered, and at the C locality, it was virtually impossible. It was just really completely covered with alluvium. So looking at these three, I wanted to call out three different marker beds. This lowermost one is distinctive in that it has a different look than all the rest of the units of the virgin limestone, which is predominantly that pale to middle, like medium gray limestone. This unit is a peachy tan color. It really stands out. It's got a different texture than the rest of the limestone. And um, the other thing is that there is a spike in the trace metals analysis, which I'll be talking about a little bit more later. So this is kind of an unusual unit. It's also nice to look at the um, way it stands out as a marker bed. So this is one of the units I use to place myself in the stratigraphy. And this is a notable um, shot because of um, the fact that you can see faulting here. Right there there's a fault, there's a fault, and here's another fault in this kind of dip. So that shows that up at the C locality. This is C looking kind of uh, southwest towards the outcrop along the escarpment. The slope you'll notice is a lot gentler. It's more covered over, and that's possibly due to the faulting. The other marker bed that I wanted to call out here 
is a bivalve pack stone. Lower units are mudstone, and then the upper and horizons in between are covered with these convex up oriented bivalves. They're really distinctive in that you've got this kind of teardrop shape you can see here in the upper corner. The other thing is that they're uh, recrystallized with coarse calcite. Usually it's a pink color or a white color. And what makes this interesting is that the orientation of these large shells convex up, it's like up to three centimeters in length, um, speaks to the idea that you have a shoaling upwards in this unit where uh, there's a higher energy environment that allows for winnowing of these larger shells and also for them to be flipped into a um, configuration that yields less friction to moving water. So this speaks to stronger currents or wave action going on within these units. Is the stromatolites themselves here, here, and here. And those we've seen some pictures of, so I'm going to real quickly move on through there. Um, the A locality was also better um, exposed, and I was able to get to the full 149 meters of stratigraphic section. So this is the uppermost portion of the locality A stratigraphy, and here's a photograph. So if you'll recall, looking at the northernmost sites, it was kind of a more gentle slope, versus here in the um, southernmost, you're seeing this distinctive stair step, which is kind of a trademark of the virgin limestone because of the alternating resistant limestone beds interspersed with the less resistant shales. So this stair stepping unit, um, these units here up at the top are these units here of massive limestone. Um, going into a little bit more detail into the stratigraphy, um, there's a pattern that emerges of packets of upwardly coarsening sediments. So I interpreted this as shoaling upwards, starting with a uh, sub wave base, shale quiet, very low energy environment, um, followed by mudstone, which is a slightly more energy, uh, a slightly more energetic environment because you have occasional storm beds that are bringing pockets of shell hash and sometimes pellets or ooids into the mudstone layers. Um, the bottom most part is generally just homogeneous mudstone. The storm beds become more pronounced and more frequent moving up through it. And then finally the topmost layer is usually where the coarsest grains are located. So there's an example uh, about midway up the A locality stratigraphy. Um, you see the same kind of pattern in the next overlying unit of shale, mudstone, increasing number of shell beds, and then finally the topmost uh, contains bivalves and there's also hummocky cross stratification indicating a higher energy environment. And finally you also see this pattern in the stromatolite unit itself. So there's an underlying shale layer there. You can see the lamination still present. Um, the stromatolite, usually the lower units, are micrite with a few pockets of shell debris or there might be a few pellets in them, but generally it's micritic. And then the uppermost layer is a pack stone of ooids and shell debris. So you're seeing a shoaling upwards. Um, going to the next portion, which is the geochemistry, um, and showing this in context with stratigraphy. Um, these all came, all the shale samples came from the A locality, which is the southernmost where the exposures were best. Shales that were excavated um, were washed with DI, they were dried, and then run through the ICP OES to determine the concentration of trace metals. Um, those raw, the raw data of concentrations was, um, they were normalized to average shale values to yield a ratio that's unitless. Those are the enrichment factors that are plotted. So that accommodates, um, that takes into account detrital input when you're looking at the enrichment of these trace metals. So this graph is the same graph that was plotted alongside the stratigraphic section. It just gives you a little bit more detail and I separated out. These are the metals that are related to oxygenation state, molybdenum and vanadium. And what you'll notice is that there's a significant peak at unit four. That was that peach colored siltstone. Um, and then there's a lesser peak building up at the stromatolite bearing layer. These are the shale immediately underlying the stromatolite. This is the infill immediately above the stromatolite. So these two peaks are significant in that you do show um, some temporary dysoxia. It's not very strong and you don't see 
dysoxic or anoxic conditions across the entire stratigraphic section. It's just these pulsed intervals. In the case of Unit 4, because this is very close to the bottom of the uh, virgin limestone, when you're still in kind of a, a transition phase between the tidal flat red beds and moving up into the shales and siltstones, um, it's likely that this was a restricted lagoon and that could have allowed for stagnation um, that would have caused this temporary period of anoxia. However, once you get to the stromatolite layer, you're really well established in the limestone units. So this um, I'm interpreting as due to the influx of anoxic water from deeper on the shelf into the shallower shelf environment. And again, these are short-lived short perturbations that are um, not seen beyond these units. Moving on to the metals, barium, copper, nickel, and zinc, these are associated with productivity and the burial of organic carbon. So you see the same kind of pattern here. Of course, there's a lot more noise in this data, but you see a peak associated with unit four, that was that tan peachy siltstone, and then again, you see a gradual rise in the um, shale immediately underlying the stromatolite unit, and then a peak associated with the infill of the stromatolite units. So again, this points to two periods of perturbation with the ocean water chemistry. Um, so the final phase of the investigation is looking at microbial fabrics. These are a couple examples of slabbed samples. So these were hand samples that were polished. Um, and once you actually get a fresh surface, you can see these iron stained zones really enhance the texture. Um, this is an example that was collected from that BB transect. Um, it's a sample that was a meandering ridge that was cut. Uh, a petrographic thin section was prepared and you can see this is the resultant slide. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about these. And this is a nice example of an uh, individual dome in which the pinched up mud core was actually preserved and incorporated into the stromatolite. And I was able to make a uh, large thin section. This is a two inch by three inch. I think that's a 55 by 75 millimeter slide. So this allowed me to look at different levels within a single stromatolite dome, which was really valuable. And this is a thin section showing the, here's the mud core, and this is an overlying layer of encrusting paper pectins in this lowermost unit. And again, I'll kind of go through this a little bit more in the, in the next slides. So going back to this is the individual dome. Uh, different views were photographed from these different intervals to try to characterize what's going on in this dome structure. So once again, here is the muddy infill. Here are these encrusting layers of paper pectin shells, these wavy forms. Um, they're present on both sides of the neck of that pinched up mud core, which is right here. And in the lowermost portion of the stromatolite, this is actually just off, off frame here. So this is an, on, um, I'm sorry, an oncoid shell? Oh, sorry, orthocone, orthocone shell. Um, that was also incorporated along with another bit of bivalve shell there. So you're seeing some coarser debris at this layer of encrustation. However, as you move up through the um, stromatolite into some of these laminated intervals, it gives way into this macritic matrix. It's largely going to be homogeneous micrite, and then a few small isolated pockets of pellets. Um, and finally, at the uppermost layer here, there's another level of encrustation. So that speaks to the idea of there being um, intervals that favor encrustation and intervals that favor microbial-like growth. So you're seeing different phases and possibly pauses during the accretion of these laminae. Um, these are a couple examples of specimens in outcrop showing this pinched up muddy matrix in the middle of a really well-developed domal stromatolite. Um, the next morphology to look at is these really um, large, thick aggregates of well-formed columns and domes. And because these are so much larger, um, I'm going to present them as how I collected them from different intervals. So an example is this one outcrop where I collected a sample from the lowermost exposed unit. So this was where the shale was weathered away below it, um, further up in that stromatolite section. And then there's kind of a natural break there. 
and then picking up another laminated interval, and then the overlying material here. So this is trying to characterize the entire thickness of that stromatolite. Um, this is an example of the billet that was cut from this A007. Again, this was one of the large format ones. So I was able to look at the bottommost and the topmost units. And what was interesting is um, the upper layer of this A007 was also encrusted with the paper pectin shells. So this shows that there was an interval of encrustation before the next layer of stromatolytic fabric was um, accreted. Uh, the center part of A007, so this part where the lamination is visible in hand section, does not show lamination in the microbial fabric. This is just stylolamination, probably due to diagenesis dissolving some of the carbonate and leaving behind a little bit more detrital debris. So for the most part, the center part of the stromatolites are just homogenized micrite. However, you do see these encrusting horizons, and that's kind of the takeaway for um, this particular sample. Moving into A008, A009, these are more of the homogeneous micrite. Again, here's just a little bit of that encrusting a few paper pectin shells, but for the most part, these are made up, again, of homogeneous micrite. Um, and then looking at the overlying mudstone, these, again, are fairly homogeneous micrite. It is not as exciting, but in the case of these two slides, they're uh, showing that upward coarsening. There are a few examples near the top surface of these two where there's um, incorporated uh, clasts and some shell fragments showing that there's a little bit higher energy, maybe a storm event that would have brought in this coarse material. Additionally, I was able to capture a, um, another burrow there. So the upper layer is really um, less homogeneous than the lower layers, and that's kind of the takeaway from these larger aggregates. This is the overlying unit. So this is the mudstone, I'm sorry, this is the very, very top above the actual laminated stromatolite portion. This is an oolitic pack stone, and this is again showing the shoaling upwards as we get increasingly higher uh, energy environments and increasingly coarser materials. So this is the very top overlying unit before it goes into a covered interval of shale. So just to kind of recap, uh, there's an underlying shale unit. The core is usually micrite. There's a possible layer of encrusting paper pectins that kind of initiates the growth of these mats. Uh, middle laminae, laminae are mostly micrite. There are occasional pellets of shelly debris. Um, upper laminae are usually going to be the same kind of thing, but there's going to be more frequent zones of wacky stone. There's going to be larger pieces of shelly debris. There's going to be more frequent pockets of pellets and occasional bioturbation. And then finally, the overlying portion of the unit is going to be an oolitic or bioclastic pack stone, much coarser. Um, this is the third morphology. This is that lozenge type with the overhanging muffin topping sides. And um, this is the same outcrop looking at the cross section of it versus this one is looking at the top down. Samples were collected from the underlying uh, laminated portion as well as from that overtopping bulging area. So this is looking at the lowermost. Um, two billets were cut from samples A004, A005. These are generally homogeneous micrite. Um, here are examples of the thin sections. In this, A005 is a little bit um, unusual in that I think there were three or four samples in which these little rounded or chain-like oblong forms were observed. Those are likely going to, uh, those are likely blue-green algae that were actually preserved. Um, A004, occasional lenses of shelly debris, but for the most part, you're getting just micrite. Looking at the top surface with this overhanging side, a larger billet was cut here, and you can see in this cut section that you can observe laminae um, that encrust all the way on both the top surface and also the vertical sides. These are made up of the paper pectin shells, as shown here and here, and those correspond to this outermost encrusting layer and this inner laminated layer. Um, however, if you look at the center of one of these um, lozenge-shaped domes, A003, it's primarily that homogeneous micrite again, and this is the overlying gray siltstone. I'll back it up real quick. That's this gray siltstone. 
So those are um, what the interior of those aggregates or those lozenge-shaped masses are. Finally, looking at, this is an example of a meandering ridge collected from the southernmost locality in that BB in the stream, uh, in the drainage. Um, when it's slabbed, you can see it's kind of a clotted texture. You don't have the well-preserved lamination. They're discontinuous. They're just completely messed up. And it's also apparent in the thin section. Um, when looking at it, there's a lot more frequency of pellets, and there's more of a clotted texture in these. And this is likely due to the fact that there's bioturbation that might have led to the smaller forms and the more irregular shapes and the lack of lamination. This is examples of thin sections that were cut. Um, it's the same meandering ridge and intergrown dome form, but this is from the northernmost locality. And because samples were fewer up there, just because the exposures were so much poor, um, I was trying to look at more of the structure of individual large specimens that were collected. So the lower section, I cut both a vertical and a horizontal. This is the horizontal transect to get a better idea of the structures going on. So looking at it horizontally and, I'm sorry, looking at it vertically and horizontally, you're seeing this clotted fabric. Um, the middle of the dome, likewise, uh, clotted fabric. And when looking at it horizontally towards the top of this unit, um, a lot more shelly debris here, some more of these bivalve shells, and they're disordered. It's not a nice encrusting layer, it's mishmash. And then finally, the uppermost layer is, um, has this mottled, marled appearance. Again, there's no order to the class within it when you look at the cross section horizontally. And the other thing to note about the vertical is that the top surface was eroded. So this speaks to the idea that there was something disturbing these particular stromatolites as they were growing. So in conclusion, just to kind of recap, the, portion, uh, the findings of the field investigation and tie it together. Uh, stromatolites likely grew in a subtidal environment, uh, subject to occasional high st energy storm events. The fact that they were, um, they don't show signs of desiccation like mud cracks, the fact that you have high relief above the seafloor in these really large aggregates and the individual domes um, suggest this deeper water environment where they were sheltered. The high energy storm events are indicated by the um, inclusion of larger class, for example, the pebbles, uh, the pellets, and shelly debris in the stromatolite laminae as they're growing. Um, looking at the trace metals, vanadium enrichment indicates that the entire section was not anoxic, allowing for the formation of the stromatolites. Rather, there was short-lived dysoxia, and it corresponds with a time when uh, there was enhanced burial of organic material, potentially linked to high productivity. Uh, Burrowing metazoans were active periodically during stromatolite accretion and growth, as well as phases of encrustation. This again speaks to the periodic nature of environmental stresses that would have um, uh, prevented uh, metazoan growth and colonization. The variation in stromatolite morphology and fabric, therefore, is likely related to the degree of bioturbation. Um, and this kind of reiterates, growth of stromatolites was periodic, as shown by the encrusted layers. And this again talks to the short-lived nature of the fluctuations in environmental conditions. So there's a more complex um, model of reef growth instead of a simple suggest succession model wherein all organisms are wiped out and there's a steady progression from a very simple microbial light dominated reef system to a more complex metazoan dominated skeletal reef system. So. That concludes the actual talk. So before I go, I'd like to um, acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Woods, for the generous use of his lab and a lot of <laughs> patience over the years, as well as all the reading of his of drafts. I'd also like to thank my committee members, Dr. Kirby and Dr. Benuso, especially for their flexibility in helping me finish this off and making this happen today. I'd um, also like to thank the Associated Students for two grants that allowed for me to do the first two rounds of thin sections through uh, National Petrographic Labs, and also just to the department for the support and for the availability of resources. So. Any questions, or is this where we close it out?